I'm Katel Le Goulven, and this is Mission to Change. Let's go, and we're switching to, uh, we're going to switch to English. Yes, you will have my accent, that's for sure. <laughs> and mine as well. The show where I hear from people who turn business into a force for good and learn about their journey to make it happen. Today, I meet with Hubert Sagnier, the vice chairman of the largest eyewear company in the world, Essilor Luxotica. And Hubert is on a mission to eradicate poor vision from the world. We want to eliminate poor vision in one generation, meaning from one, from one seven billion people seeing well today to eight billion people seeing well in uh, 2050, when we build a 30 years business plan, reaching in 10 years a level of 100 million new people to whom we gave off their first pair of eyeglasses on 20 years and with a ramp up from zero to 100 in 10 years. As we speak, 2019, we were at around 45 million. Hubert Sagnier spent 33 years with Estilor, became the CEO and chairman in 2012, a position he held until recently when his company merged with Luxotica. He's now the vice chairman of Exilor Luxotica, the world's largest producer of eyewear lenses and frames. But Hubert doesn't measure success in the number of lenses made or the number of frames sold. He measures success on a more human scale. And he has for a long time pointed this eyewear giant at making a difference in the lives of people around the world. This quest to have a positive impact came long before he was CEO. One day, as part of the company's philanthropic day, he went on a bus to provide free eye exams to a community in South Dallas. I think I will remember all my life delivering uh, the first pair of eyeglasses to uh, actually, her name was Jessica, a young uh, six years old girl. And, and then we are not in Africa, we are not in, uh, in, in India, we are in uh, South Dallas in Texas. And it was actually on an event in a school in a poor part of Dallas, Texas. And uh, there was Jessica, myopic minus four. I was in charge of giving her the first pair of eyeglasses. It was outside under uh, the shadow of the trees. And of course, when I put uh, on her face uh, her first pair of eyeglasses, the first things we get, we are used to that, is a huge smile because she was discovering the world. But then she told me, looking at the tree, I do see leaves. What are those little stuff in the tree? It's leaves. I didn't know. The only way for me to look at trees was a big mass of green stuff. And for the first time ever, she discovered there was leaves in the trees. And believe me, on top of the smile, it gives you energy for all the year, all the following years, when you know that you have an impact. And Hubert told me he experienced moments like this many times in his career. He saw the same thing in people from many different countries, backgrounds, genders, and ages. Each time, it gave him the same feeling of genuinely changing someone's life. And for Hubert, it was clear, this had to be the guiding mission for his company. And remember, he's not CEO yet. But as he told me, You don't need to be a CEO at all. Mm. You can do that at every level where you stay in your own corporation. So in 2007, he created the Estilor Vision Foundation. The foundation works to eliminate poor vision and give people a better life through better sight. Our mission is eliminating poor vision from the world. We know uh, uh, that when we give eyeglasses to someone, we have an immediate impact on their life. People suddenly can find a job, they get more self-esteem because they can contribute uh, to their own community, their village. It's a way to eliminating poverty. And indeed, from South Dallas to rural India, the World Health Organization estimates that 2.2 billion people suffer from vision impairment and blindness. And of those people, about 1 billion cannot be treated with glasses or access to medical aid. 
A study by the American Association of Ophthalmology estimated that, in 2015, the global productivity loss associated with impaired vision and blindness reached as high as $244 billion. It's simple. People cannot reach their full potential if they can't see well enough to read, to perform a task, or to just get around safely. The realization that his company could turn this situation around is what drove Hubert to become CEO of Estilor. The epiphany or the, the tipping point, the big turn, happens maybe when the board of directors of Estilor asks me to get ready to be the next chairman and CEO. You are never prepared for such a job. I was just hesitating. And I was chatting with a lot of friends and uh, mentors and things like this. One of them, an important one, which is my brother, told me the following things. And he told me, but Hubert, you have been so much involved in the mission of Essilor. The past 10 years, every time we see you, you chat about how important it is to have a good vision. Now it's time for you to do it. If you're number one, you can go global and have an impact on the world. I said, oh my God, yes, of course. And it's obvious I can have a real impact, not only on a small population, but really on the world. When he became CEO in 2012, Hubert saw how he could increase the impact of his mission if he put it at the center of everything Estilor was doing. He called this placing mission above strategy. And here is how he explains what that means in practice. It means you have to have a strategy at every price point. So it has an impact on how you will develop your R&D and your marketing and your product. You want to do that everywhere in the world. You can't have only a strategy in one country. And it means also you have to find ways to work on your distribution of your product, retail and frame. You just can't do it alone. You have to develop a strategy with an open model. You have to be totally irreproachable. It means your governance has to be absolutely top-notch. So when you articulate all this, this is where mission is driving the strategy and not the opposite. Okay, so let's explore what are the steps to place mission above strategy. In reality, the journey to get there was a little more messy. When you are looking uh, 15, 20 years after at something you have built, uh, it sounds big and very well organized and all this. But the story of building it is very different. But let's try to reconstruct and identify the defining steps of this journey. The starting point is really defining a mission, having an impact on the world finding the right equilibrium between philanthropy, impact business model, and the more traditional business model. For 170 years, that traditional business model at Essilor had been the exact same as the whole optical industry, to sell glasses to the 1.7 billion retail customers who could afford glasses. It is according to this model that market analysts made growth projections and that investors evaluated the performance of companies and of their leadership teams. But Hubert looked at it differently. From his experience with the Estilor Foundation, he knew that glasses could change lives for more than these 1.4 billion people. What is then needed was the evidence to show it. We wanted to know if really we can measure our impact. So I asked the team in India to come back on measuring the impact on 1,000 people we have given eyeglasses the past 10 years. We found a few months after that in 87% of the case, the people interviewed who got their first pair of eyeglasses in the past 10 years, their life has totally changed. And the first reason was a discovery. The first reason was safety. I was with my new eyeglasses. I felt very comfortable to go out of my home, walk barefoot in the street, being able to see broken glasses or snakes. I was unable to do it before because I didn't see my feet. 
Of course, the second reason why keeping a job, found a job, and things like this. And it was the birth of the Essilor mission department that we have now within Essilor Luxotica. And when you look at it differently, when you measure the potential impact instead of potential profit, it becomes clear in an instant servicing all people is just good business. It's not philanthropy for the poor. It's helping people to see better, to feel better. And this is how Hubert and his senior management team broke from 170 years of tradition and changed the mission of Isilor to eradicate poor vision from the planet by 2050. It was a shock for everyone, a positive shock, but everyone was behind. Why was it a shock? Because we know, again, connecting the, connecting the dots was a positive shock. We all knew that we had impact. But when we are able to measure the impact, when you, mm -hmm. have, able to, when you have the facts in front, in front of your eyes, wow, that's powerful, that's impactful. Having this mission as a new North Star completely changed the way Essilor worked. As Hubert told us earlier, it gives them a strategy for every price point. For example, looking at product development. They had to innovate, not only to serve the evolving needs of customers who can afford glasses, but also had to develop inexpensive frames for low-income markets. It honestly all sounds too good to be true. I love the story, but after a decade of hype, researchers studying win-win business strategies now seem to agree that there are trade-offs between profit and purpose, that doing good and making money rarely aligns, and that business leaders must make tough choices between the two. But Uber won't budge. I prefer to phrase it a different way. It's what we call the two Ps, purpose and performance. Performance, I think, is a much more important word than profit for a corporation. And believe me, purpose and performance, the two Ps, it goes together. It is interconnected. And how you manage to, to convince the board, investors, etc., that that was the way to go. What I'm trying to um, convey as a message here is that in our case, for Essilor, By delivering eyeglasses to 3 billion people, in many ways, mm -hmm. we are creating the customer of the future. When you are able to develop a mission and then a strategy who has an impact on 8 billion people, and when you know that having a good vision is an addiction, meaning that people will always find a way to get another free pair or to purchase a pair at $5 in some countries, or purchase eyeglasses at $20, and then $50, and then $100, you're creating the future growth. So the industry, in our case, instead of growing at 3% per year, mm -hmm. is growing now at 10% per year over the next 30 years. So all the stakeholders who are looking at us, evaluating our performance, they know that what we are doing in our social business, inclusive business model, philanthropy, it has an impact on the performance on the long run. But once you are able to convince your shareholders, convince your investors, your board of directors, even the people you hire into your teams, that actually what you are doing is on one side for good, on the other side, it's also a business, then, believe me, people are looking at your corporation in a very different way. It's really what you call the business for good. Mm. It is for good, but of course, it is a business. One of the challenges he faced in executing his mission above strategy motto inside Essilor was making sure it became part of the culture, that it was owned by every part of a $60 billion multinational company with more than 70,000 employees working in 78 countries around the world, all with different markets and clients to serve. So we had, at a certain point, in the story of developing the Essilor Luxotica mission to actually englobe everyone 
not only the people in the field in India, Africa, or Asia, helping the people in need to purchase, to get access to an eyeglasses at $5, but to be extremely also proud when we are able to actually uh, deliver eyeglasses at five, 600, 1,000 euros. So yeah, at a certain point of time, we had to re-articulate the mission of a filler to make it, let's say, acceptable by everyone. So for everyone within the corporation, they will recognize themselves in their own contribution to the mission. There is something in it for everyone. Mm -hmm. The clerk doing accounting somewhere in one of your subsidiary, he has to recognize he can himself contribute to this mission. To tackle this challenge, he created the position of chief mission officer. Someone reporting directly to him, dedicated to ensure that the mission was owned by all internally. The head of your mission has to be credible. Mm -hmm. To find a leader who is credible, he has to match a certain amount of criteria. In our case, it was, it was quite obvious. The biggest move of the action plan was done in India between the year 2000 and 2010. So for me, it was absolutely obvious that the head of India was the best person to lead the mission. He also proved that he has the passion for what he was doing. His name is Giant Bugaravan. And one day I came to him and I said, Giant, I want you to be my CMO. And uh, for the time being, it's you and me. Mm -hmm. You will not be judged on profit and, and your p &L. It took him a minute to say, yes, Banco, I am with you. So now where do we start? How do you know he does a good job? The simple key indicators we have found was number of people, number of lives, we have helped every year. Just this, how many people got free eyeglasses or eyeglasses below $5 in the business model we have developed. This, and this is still the unique indicator that actually we are using and following every month. How many people have we helped? So in the context of Istilor, creating a chief mission officer function and filling it with an internal candidate worked. Does it mean that every company should do that to elevate mission above strategy? You don't hire out for a chief mission officer. Do I hear you correctly? No, I don't think so. It all depends on the maturity of your own mission in your corporation. We started from scratch with passion, with a product that actually has an immediate impact when you give it to someone. In that case, I had the ideal candidate with Giant in India. Uh, if you are another type of corporation where actually you have other type of needs, other type of resources, maybe you need someone more marketing, someone more in logistic. Okay. Maybe you need someone more into uh, communication and advocacy. After 30 years of effort and with a chief mission officer in the C-suite since 2013, Hubert is now confident that mission above strategy is now corporate culture at Essilor and that nothing can shake it. The Essilor mission today, it's hundreds of people with teams in more than 40 countries. Uh, we have, it's a division of Essilor Luxotica. There are a lot of strong leaders. On top of this, you have a CMO, a chief mission officer, and he is the champion. I see myself as having been the, the facilitator from day one. But we have tens of champions that actually are extremely much more important in what they do within the organization. This, of course, begs the question, what about the recent merger with Luxotica? Did this threaten a change in mission above strategy approach? In my case, in any case, was really the the consequences of the mission. We want to eradicate provision from the world. We need frames. We need better distribution. So the merge with Luxotica was an obvious move as far as developing our mission a step further. When we did this merge with Luxotica three years ago, the mission was 
absolutely part of uh, in writing on the commitment of the corporation. This, the first page of the legal documents explain what we are doing with this mission. Both companies mm -hmm. add this in their own DNA, doing things in a very different way. Landscrafters slash Luxotica uh, is really the leader in philanthropy everywhere in the world in optics. Mm -hmm. We are more the leader in uh, impact social business model. So both of them were, was actually doing the same thing using different words. So through the merger, it was absolutely obvious that it has been the, the articulation of the mission has been, still is, a very important tool for integration. Today, it is a key strategic position within the group that will continue, of course, in the next, uh, in the next generation. Is there, I mean, is there any moment in that 30 years journey where you have had serious doubt about the fact that you could push that agenda that far? I never had any doubts, any second thoughts about this mission. But yes, maybe we could have done things a little uh, a different way. So we are practitioners. We create, we invent, we do. I wish we could be much more marketers of what we do. But when you spend so much time doing, you have less time sharing and communicating. We were so much in our mission that we were blind on the fact that it needed to be communicated much more. We were shy. We were maybe too humble doing things and assuming that people will discover that we are doing good. I think if I had to do it again, I will put a little more resources on communicating, articulating, doing the marketing of, of what we are doing. We have started that few years ago. We should have started this maybe 20 years ago. To all people working in business without being at the helm, Uber is clear. You do not need to drop everything and move to an NGO to have impact. If you have it within yourself, you can do this. You can do business for good in any position, in any corporation. And to all the CEOs out there wanting to do good but not knowing where to start, here is Hubert's suggestion. To dream, to dare, and to do. And when I say do, when you are able like us to articulate such a powerful mission, if you do it, do it first class. Mission to Change is a podcast by the INSEAD Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society in collaboration with Intent. It's created and produced by human humans. The original music, sound design, and mixing is by Palomino. And special thanks go to Cody Gildert and Maria Latore. For more, you can go to insead.edu slash mission to change.